this recording is going to look at the Stratagem EH5 data processing and uh, this data processing is done using the EH5 Pro software and the first thing we're going to want to do is to connect to the Stratagem EH5 receiver box through its Wi-Fi. So in order to do that I need to go to the Wi-Fi uh, the network window and the name of that receiver's Wi-Fi will be EH5 and the serial number of the EH5 receiver box. And this serial number happens to be 1013. So I will click that and I will connect Now, in order to do this, obviously the receiver needs to be turned on. And you'll notice that it says uh, I am connected to the uh, EH5 1013 Wi-Fi. It also says no internet. So there is no internet connection. This is a direct Wi-Fi connection with the EH5 receiver box. Okay. So the first thing we want to do is we want to go to our browser and connect to that Wi-Fi. And uh, through the Wi-Fi to the uh, to the receiver box. Uh, now, you can do this on any device that has a browser. It can be a, uh, an Android cell phone, an iPhone, a Windows tablet, an Android tablet. But in order to process the data, you need to have the data on a Windows uh, tablet or PC uh, because the uh, EH5 Pro software runs on a, a Windows operating system. So I'm going to go to my browser and if this is the very first time you've ever done the connection and then you need to type in HTTP uh, slash slash, I'm sorry, colon, slash, slash, and E, H, so it will go out and look for that connection, and it is now seeing that receiver box. And you can see at the upper right hand corner, it shows the two batteries. There is only one battery installed at this point, and it is almost entirely charged. And you can also see the five channels from the box. And right now, the box has nothing connected. So this is just environmental noise that is uh, on those open connectors. So we can't really make a measurement since I'm here in the office. Okay. And 
when it's green, it indicates that it is uh, uh, looking at the data but not recording any data yet. So if we go down to the three dots on the lower left hand corner, it brings up a menu and this is the time of acquisition. Uh, if I'm running it on manual and uh, when I start it, it will record for the amount of time that I tell it. Uh, let's say I want to record for one hour and zero minutes. And then when I start, it will record for that period of time and then automatically shut off. Um, typically, I'm going to start with just a short acquisition, maybe 20 minutes. And auto hour and auto minutes is if I set a specific time that I wanted to start. But we'll do it on, uh, on the manual at this point. Come down here and I look where it says more. I click on that and I can set up all of the survey parameters here on the box. My gain uh, right now the default for the e-gain is 10 dB, or 10 times. And for the h-gain, that's 2 times. And we will leave that. The power line frequency, uh, if you are in North America and parts of Central and South America, you will have a 60 Hz. Uh, power line frequency. If you're in Europe, Asia, most of Africa, and uh, most of South America, uh, you will be using a 50 hertz power line filters. But we'll leave it on 60 hertz because we're in the United States. The EX azimuth. This is the orientation of the, uh, of the sensors. Uh, right now, it's set as zero degrees for EX, which defines the, uh, both the HX and the EY and the HY uh, because EX is going to be 90 degrees uh, rotated from the X. Okay, so EY would be at 90. And uh, let's say we are going at an orientation of 40 degrees, we could enter that at 40 degrees. That's compass declination. That's just so the next person who's looking at this, if they have a different declination set on their compass, um, they can always use the declination that was used to set the angle. The serial number. Uh, which is used for the calibration file of the two coils. These are the magnetic coils. And uh, the two that I've got uh, for this system are 1553 and serial number 1554. And if we were using a, um, a third coil for measuring vertical fields, we would enter that as well. So HX, which is a coil laid out in the x-direction, and HY is the coil 
1554 in this case, it's laying out in the Y direction. Down here is the EX length. That is the dipole length between the EX positive electrode and the EX negative electrode. And in EY, uh, it is the, uh, the length of the uh, electrical Y dipole. So once those have been entered and they can be changed, let's say that this one is only 40 meters, for example, uh, we could enter that. And EU high will leave it the same. If I go more to who, and then I can just give it some basic information. What is the site's name, who is the operator, and any comments that we might have about this site. Okay, so once we've done it, I'm going to go ahead and change that back to 50. Once we've set all this information, we can click on Save. And when we save it, this information is sent via the Wi-Fi to the receiver box. And all those parameters are set in the receiver. Save. Okay. Oh. What I don't recall, I think I set 20 minutes for the acquisition time. Okay, we've got 20 minutes for acquisition time. <clears throat> now, when I click the green Jim Hetrix icon at the bottom of the screen, it will give me information about the setup. Um, will give me the, uh, it is in a manual start, and uh, the coil numbers and calibration file numbers, and the dipole length for both the EX and EY dipole. I click on OK. And what that does, it always starts on an even number of seconds. So right now, this orange, it is counting down. Okay. And once it counts down on manual, it will immediately start. And you can see that all of these time series are uh, in the red color. So we'll go ahead and leave that red. So what I'm going to do now is just let it collect data. And uh, again, this is not good data because uh, this is only being done <coughs> inside a building. And there are no sensors connected to the receiver box. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do now is I am going to open up the EH5 Pro software. can do is I can make some changes uh, directly from here in the uh, in the setup and by going to EH5 acquisition parameters and I had previously set up to record four channels because we are recording 
two electric channels and two magnetic channels. And uh, it is a five channel box. There are actually two electric and three magnetic. Uh, the third magnetic will collect vertical field, um, but we don't have the, uh, the vertical field sensor for this system. Uh, so instead of four channel, five channels, I'm only going to use four. And then I can change the gains here. I can change from manual to schedule and other parameters such as the dipole lengths, the, the calibration file names, and the uh, um, yeah, other information. Uh, the filters that we're using, the line filters, are 60, and again, you can change that to 50 here. Okay, and uh, since I am in the midst of collecting, I'm not going to save this to the, uh, to the EH5. I'm just going to save it to the, uh, the parameters file, which will save any changes that I've made. And so I can always go back and get this configuration if that's the one that I want to use. Uh, it will default back to that anyway uh, once I've saved it. Okay, and if I wanted to upgrade the information in the actual receiver box, and then I would save the parameters to the EH5. Okay. And now I'm going to exit. So after I've collected data, and I need to collect at least five minutes worth of data because each record is a five minute record. But once I've done that, I can go and I can go to file and I can download the all of the records all of the files from that receiver box directly through the wi-fi to the computer for processing okay so this is old data that was uh, already stored in that computer and we can see that the day and time here was the 4th of May of this year. So that is all old data. And there's some data also from the 15th of May and then there is today's data, which is the, uh, the 26th of May. So we collected one site at 15.58, and we're in the process of collecting another site at 15, I'm sorry, 16.03. So this is 3.58. And five minutes later, we're collecting at 4.03. Now, since all of this old data uh, has already been downloaded and is not necessarily, what I could do is I could just delete them from the box so I don't get confused about them in the future.
and I'll just click on delete and yes I do want to delete that old data is from May 4th, so it's old. I'm going to get rid of it. And there's other old data in there. I'm going to get rid of all of that. So, now what I've got is just the data from the day. There are three data files. TS1 is the high-frequency data. TS2 is the mid-band data. And TS3 is the low-frequency data. And this is the date and time that it was acquired. This is the size of those data files in kilobytes, so you can see that they are very large files. And the naming convention, the first four digits are the serial number of the box, and then the date, 2023, May 26th, and, um, and the time. Now, this time is the, uh, is the uh, Julian time, I believe, or the, uh, uh, the prime meridian time. Okay. So, we can go ahead and just let that continue to, uh, to, uh, to do that, to uh, collect data. So now if I come down to the bottom, I'm, I can use the local time, or if that's not clicked, I use the GPS time. And uh, download today's data only, if that's clicked. So I wouldn't have collected, I wouldn't have downloaded the, uh, the other ones that I've already deleted. Uh, I can delete the data. I can download all of the data, and I can download it in the background, meaning I'm not seeing the, uh, the image of the, uh, the data being downloaded. And minimum time interval between sites is at least 10 minutes. Okay. So, um, and if I click on download all, and then it would download everything, if I only wanted to download the first three data files, I can click on that, and then click on download and it will only download those files that I have that I have chosen. But since this is only data in an office and not real data, we won't bother with that. So I'm just going to close this window. Okay. So the one thing I did not mention, go back that download EH5 data files. So it is each one of these is five minutes, uh, 358, 403, and five minutes later is 408. So it's in the process of collecting that next data. So that was the first five minutes, the next five minutes. So it's five, 
10, and this will be the 15 minutes. So if we were actually to go back and look at this, it tells me that we've been collecting data for 12 minutes. So the first five minutes was that first set of data, the second five minutes is at the 10, and it's go, it's right now it's on the, uh, the next five minutes, and then it'll do another five. Okay, but I'm gonna close this because I'm not gonna download this data. But the, uh, the thing that you do want to see is where it is going to be stored once we download the data. So the file download folder in the local computer, um, there is an EH5 data folder. And this is a folder that was created on the day that that data was acquired. And we can do that. We can create folder by the date. So if I were to click on this, it would create a new folder, which is 2023, May 26th. Okay. So it will download it to that folder. But again, I'm not going to bother downloading. Uh, or what we can do is we can download it to a folder that we choose. So I am going to go to uh, EH5. EH5 data. We'll try that. And I am going to create a new folder under EH5 data. So I will go to new folder and just call it uh, Doug test. So, right now I've created a new folder called Doug Test, and I've got these six files for the first 10 minutes, and I will download all. So my computer is fairly slow. If I had clicked on download all in background, and then it would not display these windows, so I could go and look at other things that I'm doing. Okay. So it tells me what files I'm downloading right now. And I'm downloading the TS2 file, which is the midband. And now the TS1 file. And again, these are very large files. Close this window. 
And if we were to look at that data file, I'm going to go to where I stored it, which was EH5 data. And I created Doug Test. And there are the data for the first 15 minutes of acquisition. Um, but you'll notice that these last data files, they were still in the process of being acquired. So there is no data in those files yet. So what I'm going to do is I am going to simply delete those and I'll delete it and I'll download them again once uh, those files have been fully acquired. Okay. So, one, two, three, one, two, three, and one, two, three, which are for the first 15 minutes. Okay. So, now what we want to do is we want to process this data. So I go to process and uh, I can process the last MT site. I could process only the, uh, the data that was acquired today. Uh, or I could process all of the data in the particular folder that I'm looking at. Or I can just go to empty process and choose what I want. Okay. Brings up this window. And what I need to do is I want to add the TS files to the window. Okay. Uh, I don't really want these because this is all garbage uh, because I don't have any sensors connected to the box. So I'm going to go back to another window. Oh, I don't want the EDI files. So let me go find some other data. Let's say EH5. Sorry, this portion needs to be edited out of the video while I'm looking for the data. start a, uh, again after the editing and I am going to EH5 data and I am going to under that EH5 data and grant branch which was just the test site for the TS files and there were a lot of data for a very long acquisition. And at several sites. And 
these files I'm not going to use. I'll explain that later. And I'm going to open up. So it shows me all of the TS files that have been acquired. And again, they're very large files. see all of the information about the files. They contain everything. They contain information about the dipole lengths, the calibration files, the, uh, the site name, and uh, I will change those, those names later. And over here, it says the base. Uh, that's because we did not use a remote access, I mean, remote reference. And if I did have a remote reference, I could change that to remote. And the stations that are at remote would be changed, and the ones that were not the remote would remain. But since I did not have remote in this case, they're all going to be the base survey station. And it's giving me the serial number of the receiver box and the number of channels, start time, the end time, the dipole lengths, etc. Lots of information about this. Okay. And uh, the, we can collect data down to about 1 hertz. Typically, it takes quite a bit more time to get that 1 hertz data. So very often, if all you need is maybe 800 meters or 1,000 meters, going down to 3 hertz is, is good enough. And we're on local time. And each station is going to be based on its location. That is location based on the GPS reading. Now I click on OK. And this will take some time because I'm using a very old, slow computer. And there is a lot of data here. I believe this was uh, several stations with some long acquisitions during the, uh, during the site. And Gretchen, you can edit out some of the time that it takes to do this processing because it'll be a few minutes.
Okay. So once the data has all been processed, my curves come up for the various uh, MT parameters. Uh, we're looking at the apparent resistivity here, the phase. Now on the apparent resistivity curve, the red curve is in the X direction. And this label down here says rho x, y. So that's the x direction. And the blue curve is in the y direction. So that would be rho y, x. And this is frequency. So the, uh, the frequency is looking at the... Uh, <coughs> Um, this is from low to high, so this is from the shallow to the deeper. The red, again, is EXHY, which is the phase between EX and HY. And the, um, the Y is, or the blue, is the phase between EY and HX. Coherency, it, this is a map of the coherency of the, um, for the red, the coherency, uh, how well uh, EX and HY are matched, and the blue is how well EY and HX are matched. And then the, uh, the other coherency, EX to EY, um, they're looking at different, different directions. You would not expect a coherent, good coherency between EX and EY. Um, and coherency between HX and HY are the green. And again, you would just expect that to be random because they are not looking at the same curves or the same components of the curve. The Bostic is a 1D representation of the data, and that is in resistivity and depth. And you can see we're going from about Let's see. We're going from about six meters to to about six hundred meters here. Yep. And the strike in beta, uh, basically, that is the sensor orientation. Is the strike. Uh, beta, uh, we can get into that later. And the spectral power density, this is how strong the signal is. And the uh, in the E, uh, that is in nanovolts per root hertz. So very, very, very low, a billionth of a volt per root hertz. And H. Uh, the H power density, uh, that is in um, yeah, let's see, Terra, I guess that is uh, Terra Teslas per root hertz. So, okay. And uh, there are a number of stations here. We can use the arrow keys. This one says geo. Uh, we can use the arrow keys to go to the other station.
but uh, these were not labeled very well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give each one of these stations a name. So I'm going to go to Edit, and Empty Site List, and I'm just going to call this uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. They are all, we've got their own GPS readings, which is the location, so that's not going to affect the actual location. I'm just giving each one of these a name. So I'll just call this T1, T2, T3, T4, and T5. So that's just the names of the stations. There are other things I can change in here as well. These are all for this, uh, this receiver 10. 08 and close. So now if I were to go through these stations, I can see up here this is station number one, number two, number three, number four, and number five. Okay, the other things that I can do is I can look at these individual parameters. So, if I click on this plot type menu, I can look at the apparent resistivities. So, I'm seeing four of them here. If I go to the display, I can click on that. And because there were five, I'll just do two by three, and this is going to show me all five of the apparent resistivities. And again, like we did previously, I could just display one or two and go through them simply by hitting my, my forward and back arrow keys. So there's station one, station two, station three, station four and station five. Okay. So, yeah, I can go through those again. The other thing that I tend to look at is the phase. this again and I'm going to look at my phases and both the apparent resistivity and the phases are used when we're doing a, a conversion to the 1D and the 2D images and I can go here and look at what's called the Bostic Transform, which is basically a transform from apparent resistivity and frequency to a resistivity at a depth. And this is a 1D transformation for each site. And uh, again, these are our two soundings for each site. The red is in the X direction, which typically is along the line, and the blue is in the Y direction, which typically is perpendicular to the line. Let's go back to apparent resistivity. Now, what we can do is we can edit the data. But before I edit the data, I'm going to expand the display so I can get more detail on here because it's, it is a pretty 1D environment. There's not a lot of changes, um, but we do see some changes. So what I'm going to do is I am going to change the scale. And right now I'm going from 1 to 1,000, but all of my data 
is really between 10 to 100. So I'm going to go to View, Display Settings, and my resistivity scale is set from 1 to 1,000. I'm going to change it from 10 to 100. And OK. So now what I've got is the changes in the uh, uh, blown up. So I got more detail. So in order to edit this, I am going to go up to the upper left hand corner. And this icon here is the edit icon. Click on that. And I can go and left click on individual and that is going to mask out those data points. It doesn't delete them, it simply masks them. And, uh, now editing is more of an art that you'll learn once you get more experience, but things that are way out of the curve uh, tend to be uh, caused by noise. We'll get rid of a little bit of this. Oh. And just cleaning this up a little bit. So we have some nice smooth curves. Now, you can have a split. You can have a split like this. And uh, that can be caused by changes in the, uh, the, the 2D and the 3D geology or in an actual uh, anisotropy in the, in the materials itself. And this one is a little bit dirty. That is way out of line with the curve and with the other stations. So I'm going to just clean that up a bit. So now I've done this with the uh, with the apparent resistivities. Uh, the phase is also used. So we want to look and clean up the phase as well. Impedance phase. So there are some a little bit out of the out of the scale here. Okay. And the other thing that I typically look at is the 1D transform. So go back to my plot type and do the Bostic transform. So here's the Bostic. There's some, some kind of random points in there that I'm not too confident with. Certainly that. Not. And but we will we will fix this in another way. So I can do all my editing in these individual plots, or what I can do is I can go back to my impedance curves, and I can do my editing there as well. So we've got some. I'm going to take out a few more data points here. And uh, in the apparent resistivity. And what I'm looking at is the Bostic. Now, if I come up here and click on this uh, sign uh, icon, that refreshes the screen after the editing. 
So if I've edited and refreshed, I can see what those edits have changed. Okay, let's do that again. Let's get rid of that point there, see what happens to the boss tape. Okay. And then I can do that in the other ones as well. Go to the next one. So I could leave that. And then the next one. There are some kind of random points up there. Let's see what it does to the Bostic. Okay, that cleans that up. And I missed those previously. Red. That's red. And refresh it. Cleans that up as well. Now I'm doing a left click on each one of these. If I do a double click, let's say I do a, a double click on one of these, that one right there, for example, what it does is it masks out both of the data points. Okay. So if I were to do double click, Click. There. Let's get these ones back. Um, and refresh. So, there we go. Okay, now editing is more of an art than a science, and that's basically just going to take some uh, some practice. And, and what you feel looks good, and this is only obtained through experience. Okay, and we can go through here and do the same thing in all of the rest of them. Let's say I don't like head. I'm suspicious about how valid those points are. So I can just edit them. Okay. So I won't bother going into uh, all of the other ones. We'll just leave those as they are. Okay. All right, so once I've edited all my data, and now what I want to do is I want to go back and I want to look at the 2D images. I have already seen all of my 1D, um, and that's from the, uh, the Bostic Transform. And the 2D image that we create is called an EMAP. Uh, filtered section and uh, it is not a true 2D inversion. It is based on the 1D and then all of the all of the soundings, all of the 1D soundings are basically lined up and then a filter, a, a lateral filter is applied to uh, reduce the noise between stations and to reduce what's called static offset. And this is an offset uh, caused by a, uh, a very strong near surface conductor or, uh, or resistor that's just near one of the electrodes. So, um, in order to see that, I'm gonna go to EMAP section. EMAP is the name of the filter that we use. And it asks me if I want to rotate to the profile azimuth. 
uh, sometimes your sensor is not in line with your line and it's asking you do you want to rotate the sensors if you already have it on the line it doesn't make any difference we'll just go ahead and say yes just assuming that they weren't uh, if they were it's not going to make any changes so here is my 2d section I've got data down to about 500 meters or so on this and I have some resistors up here here. I have a strong conductor that's coming in. This may be some sort of fault up in here. And <coughs> I can change the parameters of this. Oops. Sorry. I can change the parameters simply by going to view and EMAP display settings. Okay, this is my depth. Right now I'm going from about 7 meters depth down to 542. Um, let's say I'm only interested in from, uh, well, we'll leave it, it's maybe seven meters down to 500 meters and okay okay so here's my section I can also change my color scale my color scale is not going to change the data uh, it's just going to change how the data is displayed so I will go back to view and emap display and I'm going to set my color levels. Right now they're set at 15 ohm meters to 44 ohm meters. So let's go from, well 15 is fine, we'll stay there. And let's say we only want to go to 40 ohm meters. And this is a, uh, a log change. And we'll click on OK. And OK. It doesn't do much change because we didn't change it very much. But if I made a bigger change let's say go to view emap display and uh, set color level and go all the way down to 30 you can see that it makes a fairly substantial change here okay um, and again uh, this does not change the data it simply changes how that data is displayed. And after we've played with it, um, we can go back to the original default, which was from uh, color display from 15 to about 45 ohm meters. Okay. So, now we've looked at all the data, we've edited the data, we've got the section. There is a lot more in this section, but uh, Let's look at a few of these, and uh, maybe we want to look at the time series. Maybe we knew that there was a problem, that a, uh, that a cow came by and, and, uh, and got tangled up in one of the, the dipole lines and pulled it, pulled it off the stake, or a, uh, or a 
motorcycle drove by uh, near the coils and really, really sort of caused a lot of noise in that. This data set, we don't have that, but let's just say that we did. So we may want to look at the time series and kind of edit out those time series that we don't like. So I'm going to go back to the, uh, well, it doesn't make any difference. I can go back to anything where I can pull up the individual stations. So I'll just go to impedance curves. And uh, it starts out at station one. And if we want to look at those time series, I go to time series. And check current site time series. Okay. So these are all of the time series for this current site. And they're all going to have basically the same uh, GPS coordinates because that's only for this site one. And I am going to open TS files and I do a, a left click and it stops it. But I can go through the, the time series and the TS file there is 150 uh, records in that. And I can use my back arrow to key to go backwards. And at the bottom, you can see that I've got uh, 150 different time series in this, um, this file. And if I use my enter key, I can look at these individually. And HZ, there is no data in HZ because I was only collecting data on four channels. And we did not have a vertical coil in this record. And we can see that this is, if you look at the bottom, this is a TS3 file. So these are low frequency records. And I can go through there. And let's say, for example, that we came to a file that we thought was very noisy and we did not want to use it. Well, all I need to do is I can hit my delete key and what that's going to do is going to mask it out. It doesn't delete it, it simply disables this particular record. If I hit delete key again, it enables it again. Hit delete key and disables it. So I can go through all of these records and as I say there's a 150 of them in here. And those ones I don't like, I can disable. And I can go through here and look at every one of these. And because maybe, like I say, maybe a, a motorcycle drove by, or somebody turned on a, 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 a water pump, or somebody started up the motor generator and uh, it caused a lot of noise and we don't want that in the data. So we could go through there, look at the time series, and edit them out. Now these spikes here typically are atmospheric events. And that's what we're hoping for. We're hoping for atmospheric events that are uh, 
are going to be uh, uh, used as the data points. Lightning strike, typically. There we go. So that's it for that PS file. And we could, uh, after we've edited, we can save that time series file. And, uh, but I'm not going to bother because that was all good data. We could save that time series file, and we can look at another time series if we like. Maybe I want to look at the uh, that one. And I could, once I've added those, I could save it and I can uh, I can open another one. So after I've edited and saved the TS files, I can read them back in and, uh, and use those. And the other thing that I can do is save this data. I'm going to go ahead and, uh, for example, just go back to my parent resistivities, for example. So I've got all of that. I've done a lot of editing. And I want to save all those edits. So I am going to go to File. And this is the first time, so it doesn't make any difference whether I just do Save or Save As. But I'll do Save As. And I am going to give it a name. So I will just call this uh, uh, survey survey test training. And it will give it an extension, EH5. We'll go ahead and put it in this folder under EH5 data, EH5 data, Grant Ranch. So now that should be there. Survey test training.
good head of kid. Out. Open. Sorry, test training. Okay. So now it didn't have to go through all of that data processing and everything. It automatically opens it up and brings it up as we wanted to see. And we can do everything that we did before. We can do more editing. We can undo the edits. Okay, hey, the other thing I want to show you is the line position, uh, the line profile based on the, uh, the GPS readings. So I'm going to go to site location map, and these are all of the stations. Five stations based on their GPS. Here's the latitude and longitude. So I can see those. And what I want to do is I want to see these based on the site name. So I am So right now I've got station one, two, three, four, five, and the active station is the one that is in red. If I want to look at station number four, see more details, I can simply hover my my mouse pointer over that station and either do a right click. And now I'm looking at station number four in my uh, my impedance curves. And if I want to go back, I go up to the icon, this reverse icon, click that, and that goes back. And now number four shows the active station. And like I say, if I want to go to station two. I can just hover over two and do a right click. And there I am with all my data on station two. And I can do all of the, uh, the editing, etc. that I had done previously. Okay. So we've looked at that edit button. We've looked at the back and forth. We've looked at the refresh. And the umbrella is just the, uh, the masking. If I were to click on that, it's the same as clicking on delete. I'm just masking out that station. So if I did it again, it would be active again. Okay, so let's go back to the site location map. Right now, I've got my survey bearing at minus 20 degrees. So true north would be zero degrees or three. 160 degrees, so this has a bearing of 340 degrees. Minus 20 from 360. Now I can make any line bearing I like simply by changing this profile line. And the way that I do that is I get to the beginning of the profile, I hover my mouse arrow there, I 
hit the control button and draw a line where I want the circle line to go. And then when I release it, that button is there. And let's say that I don't want to start the hair, but I want to start over here and do that. So I just do the same thing. Do click on the uh, click it through there and release the control. Click it. And now I've got it. A line bearing of minus 22 degrees. So that would be uh, 338. Okay. And that would be used when we are um, uh, doing the, uh, the export for the inversion software. So, if I were to go to view, I'm sorry, and emap section, it will ask me if I want to rotate the data to the profile azimuth. So, if I say yes now with this new azimuth, then it's going to mathematically rotate the sensor location to the new azimuth. Yes. And there is our line that's basically rotated to the uh, that other line. Pretty much the same data that we had before. Okay. And we can go back to it whatever we like. Beedon's curves, polars, I'm not going to get into those details at this point, apparent resistivity, phases. The normal things that I look at are the impedance curves, the apparent resistivity curves, the impedance phase, and the Bostic transforms. And then the EMAP section, and occasionally the site location map. And I could go down here, and look at the time series for that particular, uh, for whatever site I choose. I can do that. Let's go back to the map section. So I can do that. I can save it, etc. And um, the other thing I can do is I can export the data file. I can export it as EDHI files. Now, EDHI files are standard data files for MT processing and uh, inversion software programs. And most of the commercial uh, uh, MT inversion programs, such as uh, GeoTools from uh, CGG or WingLink from Schlumberger or most of the academic software will read EDI files. Um, okay. uh, I can also, as I mentioned before, export it as a uh, or save it as a .eh5 file, uh, which will be read uh, by the Geometrics uh, GODM inversion software. Uh, that software will also read the EDI files. And there are other things that I can uh, and save it as. Okay, I can export it as an EMAP file once I've done the EMAP, etc. 
Now, on the next video that we're going to be looking at, we will be looking at the inversion software. So, uh, we're going to stop here for the meantime and uh, pick it up in our next video. So, thank you, and uh, we will see you soon.